Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As we govern ourselves at a time of worship and prayer. This prayer is worship unto the Lord. Our lives are to be a living sacrifice unto our God. The way we go about our day to day, how we start our days off, how we go throughout the day, how we end the day, from sunrise to sunset. God, we will worship you. From sunrise to sunset, we will honor you. From sunrise to sunset, we will praise your name just as it is listed when someone passes on on the obituary the date of their sunrise and the date of their sunset so God and between our sunrise and our sunset we devote our lives unto you we command our spirit man to bless your name. We command our spirit man to stand at attention unto the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. God, we don't have to ask you to come in because you're already here. We don't have to ask you to enter in because you're already here. So God, we meet you here. God, we run this your name. We meet you, God. So we lay everything at your feet. Your train to fill this temple. As we run this your name, God, and worship and prayer right now, God. Allow us to feel the wind of your train. Allow us to feel the wind of the angelic angels as they host in this room. Can you feel the wings of the angels? Can you feel the wind of his robe? Can you feel the wind of his train? God, God, we feel your wind. The wind of restoration. The wind of healing. The wind of regeneration. The wind, the wind, the wind, the wind. Everything flows in the wind. Everything moves. Healing 
worship and how we treat one another how we train up our children how we honor our mothers and our fathers and everyone that has a baby a little one God we give them to you we give our children to you and everything that we've taken back into our own hands we give it back to you because it all belongs to you our mind belongs to you our children belong to you as they are gearing up to go back to school God we thank you for the protection of our children we thank you for covering them God that no harm will come nigh thee God for you are the protector of dangerous seed
Let's get excited because it's a day we've never seen and a day we will never see again. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. Clap your hands for the Lord. Let's get a praise. Hallelujah. 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 Glory. He's worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
love you so much. We all know this next song. This song is dear to my heart too. It just really touched my spirit. So as we sing it, just reflect on all that you've been through, all that he brought you through. Just really reverence him for just who he is. His love covers all. It's great. It's wonderful. Hallelujah.
your hands together for the praise team in the band. James hit y'all with me. Yeah. James, I bet you won't do it one more time. I bet you won't do it one more time. Y'all praise team stay right there. Y'all stay back there. Y'all stay back there. James, come on up. God has been good to you. Put your hands together and bless the name of the Lord. Why don't you tell him, God, you've been good. You've been good to me. You've been better to me than I could ever be to myself. James said, when I wasn't good to myself, you was good to me. Somebody thank God for his goodness, his grace, and his mercy. Y'all please be seated, please. I will trust in the Lord. Who, who, who want to lead it? Mary, Juanita, Jennifer. There go microphone right there. Come on, man, y'all gonna play a for me.
Accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. So that is our central text starting last week, and again this week, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, is where we derive so many uh, so much of what I'm trying to kind of get across in this particular study on pneumatology, uh, which is the study of the Holy Spirit. Pneuma, the word wind or spirit, ology, study of. So when we talk about the study of the spirit and wind of God. We're talking about the study of the Holy Spirit. All right. Uh, the Holy Spirit, the third person within the Trinity. God the Father. God the Son. God the Holy Spirit. A mystery. Right. Right. And sometimes it's difficult to explain this mystery. But together, the three of them are one being in essence. So that we will never say that there is more than one God. There is one God eternally existed within three beings, three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Try to explain this to your kids and, and, and see if they won't put you in the pickle. <laughs> 2J and I were at Prime Outlets yesterday and out of the blue, he just, just for no reason, who knows what's going on in his brain. He said, so dad, there's one God, right? And I said, yeah. He said, but you said the Holy Spirit was God. I said, yes, I did. He said, but you also said Jesus was God. Yes, I did. But Jesus' father is God. I said, yes, he is. But then that's three gods. He said, it appears to be, right? Like when you hear it on the onset. But the three of them are cohesively one unit that work simultaneously all together, performing different functions, but are one God, right? They are one in essence. Jesus says, my father and I are one, right? So we take his words, his father and he are one. And so when you're articulating it, we articulate it as such. One God, eternally existent within three beings. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We spent some time talking theology, which is the study of God. Uh, so all of us, in essence, in some way, shape, or form, whether it's a low-level form or high-level form, should be aspiring to study God, theology. Like all of us as believers have a mandate to study what? To show ourselves approved. Say approved. approved. All right, so we have a responsibility to study God through his word. Um, um, 
to show ourselves approved, a workman need not ashamed, one who rightly divides the word of truth. That's theology. And then we talked about the study of Christ, Christology, and a study of the Christ, which is Jesus, the Son of God. Then we go into pneumatology, the third person in the Trinity, the third person in the Godhead, the study of the Holy Spirit. Again, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, says this concerning the Spirit. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. In fact, the man without the Spirit, the things of God are foolishness to him because they don't have the spirit of God inside of them discerning the things of God so your very Bible that you read says that the man without the spirit of God the things of God are then foolish to him listen to this language and he cannot understand what the things of God the man without the spirit of God cannot understand the things of God. That's just the Bible. Because they are foolishness to him. They must be spiritually discerned. Well, the question then comes, when do they access this spiritual knowledge to be able to discern the spiritual things of God, i.e. the scripture? It happens at salvation. So when you and I are saved, we are indwelled with the Spirit of God. Now, this is the tricky part concerning salvation. You do not get saved outside of the work of the Holy Spirit saving you. So it's twofold. It is the Holy Spirit that convicts us or then regenerates us, giving us the ability to respond to the true message of the gospel. And then it is the Holy Spirit that then teaches us those things that we see in the gospel. So nothing is done outside of the spirit. So many of you all say, I was saved by putting my faith in Jesus Christ. Yes, you were saved by putting your faith in Jesus Christ. What I'm saying to you is, is that without the Holy Spirit doing a work inside of you, you could not have made the decision to come to faith in Jesus Christ. All right. So that's a vast difference from probably what we've been taught or heard sometime. Right. All of you, by putting faith in Jesus Christ, you were saved. So salvation comes uh, by grace through faith. Faith in who? Jesus, right? So our salvation is a result of our faith in Jesus. Don't want to take that away. But what I'm saying is you cannot put your faith in Jesus if the Holy Spirit wasn't behind the scenes doing some type of work in you. That's why we read in John we cannot understand the things of God. That's, that includes salvation. Without the work of the Holy Spirit. So without you knowing and without you feeling it, yeah. the Holy Spirit was at work. And many of us have relegated the Holy Spirit to a feeling. Yeah. So, I, you know, I was always taught that the evidence <laughs> that you have the Holy Spirit right. isn't the fruit of the Spirit. Right. Isn't character transformation. Is it any of those things that you should possess internally? We're always so, how do you know you have the Holy Spirit evidence? Speaking of tongues. So you mean to tell me I can be a hellion, but speak in tongues, and I can convince you that I have the Holy Spirit? I can have a bad attitude. I can not live right. I can talk to people any kind of way, but all I got to do is get in the church and say, shout, nah, 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 And all of a sudden, you perceive, perceive me to be somebody spiritual. And so we have to be retaught what it means to be indwelled by the Holy Spirit, which is why I will always teach the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit is one and the same. 
as well as the infilling of the Holy Spirit, if you really want to get technical for, for that matter. So that's the whole purpose of this particular study, is to get a better understanding of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, all right? So we understand on onset that the Holy Spirit is a deity. Because we say the Holy Spirit is God, we say the Holy Spirit's a deity, like that, he, that he's eternally existent. In fact, the Holy Spirit possesses the same attributes of Jesus and God the Father. He's omnipotent, he's omniscient, and he's omnipresent. He's all-knowing, he's all-powerful, and he's everywhere. All right? So when we talk about the Holy Spirit, it's important for us to do this. There's a um, guy that said this quote. He said, as a Christian, Christians should, uh, that, that Christians, a Christian that is filled with the Spirit does not have more of the Spirit but rather, the Spirit has more of the Christian. And so when we talk about being filled with the Spirit, as we compare eventually the indwelling versus the infilling, it would then be improper for us to say, I want more of the Spirit. You are indwelled with the Spirit. Right? So you're indwelled with the Spirit. You don't want more of the Spirit. You just need to give the Spirit that you are indwelt with more of you. So in general, the person and work of the Holy Spirit is this. On one hand, there's a group of people that dismiss the Holy Spirit altogether or they relegate the Holy Spirit to an it, um, to a force, to some impersonal thing. And then on the flip side, there's another extreme to where when you get into uh, hyper charismatic, uh, um, yeah, hyper charismatics, you overemphasize everything being the spirit, the spirit, the spirit. Which is why so many of us, when we when we talk certain things, we say like, oh, they have an anger demon. Um, they have a fool demon. They have a sleep demon. Like, like, so we overemphasize that aspect as well. Now, the spirit of the world can be attached to anything outside of God. And so what we're saying is that they're being influenced by the enemy or the prince and the power of this air. But there's one group that just kind of overemphasizes the whole spiritual side. Like everything is spiritual. Like everything. Like, like everything. And you can't even have conversations with these type of people. Because everything is deep and out there in the heavenly heavens. I was at uh, a, a, another church and we, they were having some type of service and they were giving out miracles. <laughs> Take that back. Sorry. No. Stop. No, no. They were giving out gifts of the spirit. They were. Right, they were giving out gifts of the spirit. So this one particular lady gets on the microphone and she says that she possesses all the gifts. All, all of them. And that she was going to be dispersing them as people, as people just consecrated themselves and began to pray in the spirit. Wow. So listen, all of us have heard some of that stuff, and, and many of us would call it that we were in, trying to pray in the spirit to receive stuff too. And so when you're when you're in these settings, a lot of the stuff sounds good or feels I don't even know if it sounds good. Um, but if if you're not if you don't have an understanding of scripture, you can get bamboozled too. Yeah. So I was in this, I was in there and I was watching these people line up to go and, 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 and get gifts. <laughs> but all it takes is an examination of scripture and you realize who gives the gifts? The Holy Spirit is the one who who the Holy Spirit decides what gifts each believer is going to give. That's one of the attributes of the Holy Spirit. He gets to decide what gifts individual believers have. So one of the first errors of this particular service was there was someone else saying that they were the ones giving the gifts. And people were lining up to 
to go and get gifts. And then she laid hands on some and they fell down. And I'm sitting up there like, man, let me go up here and see what this is all about. So I went up there not to receive nothing. I, I, I really went up there to be stubborn. Like if, if you know me, then you know I can be stubborn at times. And so, yes, really. So I, I, I walked up and, and she said, what gifts do you want? I said, I don't know. <laughs> You tell me. Exactly. All right. She said, lift your hands. And I almost did it, but, you know, that's when they used the whole obedient thing. Be obedient, you know. So I lifted my hands, and she said, now, when I lay my hands on you, you're going to feel something and respond. And she laid hands, and I felt something. I felt her hand <laughs> go on my forehead. And the, the 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 push got stronger and stronger, and I didn't and I didn't move. And so what 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 happens is this though: when you're in those settings and you stay in those environments, you begin to think something is wrong with you. Maybe maybe you're not consecrated enough. Maybe you're not holy enough. Maybe maybe you didn't do something right. Let me tell you something good about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit designates who receives what gifts for the for the purpose of ministry based on his own will, right. not anything within you, all right? So there's a thing called the school of prophets now, and they take little, little instances in the Old Testament and they make doctrines out of it, and you'll be surprised how many people sign up to go to school to learn how to be prophets. I'm going to learn how to be a prophet. Or I've been in instances where people have prophesied things under the authority of the Holy Spirit that did not come to pass. And then what does the scripture say? Well, about a prophet, if you get technical, they prophesy something and it don't come to pass, they're not a prophet. So now what they say is the prophet has to work at his gift just like people work at basketball wow. to get better at the gift oh, so that they can hear more clearly what the spirit is saying. They just made an error. It's not that they're a false prophet. Wow. These are all things that are happening in our churches under the auspices of the Holy Spirit at work. I've been in settings where they were convinced that there was a cloud in the room. I didn't see the cloud. Like, do y'all not see it? Like, it's right there hovering over the room. Like, do you see it? And everybody's saying, hallelujah, I see the cloud. And I'm thinking, I don't see anything. Right. And there are instances where we can psych ourselves out yeah. and make ourselves believe something that is not necessarily true. We, we see it happen with trauma victims all the time, where you see certain things that may not have been true. So when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we just want to, we just really want to stick with the scripture and what the scripture says in the way that it should be applied. Because you're going to see stuff in the scripture, but it does not mean that it should be applied that same way to our lives today. For instance, Elijah causes fire, or by, by, no, Elijah causes rain to come down from heaven by praying. And it rains until Elijah prays again, and then the rain stops. Well, some people are going to read it, right. and then they're going to be convinced that if we pray hard enough, that we too can cause rain to come down, and then when we stop praying, the rain will stop. What we do is we take passages of scripture that was intended for a purpose, but not for you and I to be trying to do this stuff ourselves. Another, another instance, Jesus turns water into wine. There are instances where people are convinced that if they just pray hard and focus on the water and look at it hard enough, that this water will turn to wine. Those are, those are not, those are rare occurrences in the scripture. Most of them were performed by Jesus or the apostles or in the Old Testament, the prophets for a certain purpose. 
but not that you and I are to do anything. For instance, another example, when you talk about the work of the Holy Spirit of being empowered for service when it comes to our relationship with Jesus Christ. Miracles, I'm, I'm about to step on some toes. Just want to preface it. Miracles, signs, and wonders shall follow them that believe. We take it and we say, oh, we believe, right? Therefore, we should be able to perform miracles, signs, and wonders. You just keep reading the text. You see, immediately following that, then we should be able to put our hands on poisonous snakes. They bite us and we won't die. But you go put your hand in, in, in a bin of poisonous snakes and you pray, 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 pray. And you're going to meet, 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 meet Jesus immediately after. So what I'm saying is, you're going to see certain things in the scripture that are not necessarily meant for you to go and try to apply in your life, right? Certain things we see happen for a certain period of time, certain reason. Another example that I like to throw out that I will step on some people's toes again is Jeremiah 29 and 11. For I know the thoughts that I have for you concerning you, says the Lord, thoughts to prosper and not harm you, give you hope and give you a future, right? So for you and I, we can quote that to other people and say, don't you know God has a plan for you? He has a plan to prosper you and not harm you because Jeremiah 29 and 11. So what I'm saying is, it doesn't mean that God does not have the plan. But you can't use Jeremiah 29 and 11 and say that for Kira. Because Jer Jeremiah 29 and 11 was for who? Jeremiah. So if you say God has a plan, just say, man, I believe from what we see in the scripture that God has a plan for all of his children. You, mean, you say generic and you stay safe. But when you say, well, according to Jeremiah 29 and 11, well, wait, 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 wait. Because immediately when you say Jeremiah 29 and 11, then we got to get the context of Jeremiah 29 and 11. Why did he say it to Jeremiah? What was going on in Jeremiah's life? Was Jeremiah in danger of something? Was Jeremiah thinking about walking away from God? What was going on? And then why did God say it to Jeremiah? So we like to quote stuff without having an understanding of what, what was being said in the scripture in the first place. And so we've taken that stuff and we run through all of our churches just quoting stuff. Quote yourself. You know the Bible? Yeah, I know the Bible. Yeah, you might know it, but do you know it in context? Yes. Do you know the intended purpose behind what was being said and why it was being said? Even when we look at miracles in the scripture, miracles were a rare occurrence. So now we just want to go, listen, I, I never understand. Man, that's, I sound like that one pastor on YouTube that went on a rant about everything. <laughs> I never understand why those of us who possess the Holy Spirit are seeking for something else as affirmation from God. Yeah. Yeah. Like we possess Him, but we need, we need something else. And so, you know, we, we, we're looking for God to do a new thing. God to do, God do something new. God, and like it's almost like when we when you get kids stuff for Christmas. They get something, they play with it, they put it down, and now they're looking for something else. And sometimes the something else that they're looking for, they're hoping it'll satisfy something inside of them when if they just pick up what you got them last year, it does the trick. And what I'm saying is that those of us who have the Holy Spirit on, on the inside of us as believers then we ought not to be looking for God to do something new to affirm our faith or affirm our belief in him. God has already done enough. In Hebrews it says it like this. In the olden times, God chose to speak to us through the prophets. What did the prophets do? Signs, wonders, all sorts of stuff. He says, but in these latter days, he has spoken. Y'all yeah, heard it? He has spoken to us through who? His son. So everything we need to know about God, we need to go back and trace it. Go, let's go back to his son. Let's see what his son said. Let's spend our time focusing in on his son. All right? And then the son, as he's leaving the earth, he says, I'm going to send you another comforter. 
I'm going to send you somebody to come alongside and help you, which is why for Holy Spirit, we have this word parakletos. One who just comes alongside of us in this journey through life that you and I are on as believers. He comes alongside us and he teaches us all things concerning God's word. And he reminds us of everything that Jesus has already said. So then the Holy Spirit does not speak on his own accord. That's right. The Holy Spirit speaks in harmony with who? God the Father and God the Son. So if someone tells you that the Holy Spirit says something that you cannot validate in God's word, then it's safe to assume that that is false and you should run far away from it. I don't care how good it makes you feel. Because we hear stuff and all you got to do is tickle our little ears. You know, sister, I was praying at 5 a.m. this morning. And the Spirit put your face in my brain. And he told me to call you and tell you to leave. So if you've been dealing with something and you've been contemplating right, leaving, right, right. to you, this is affirmation. Yeah. <laughs> See, yeah. I've been praying about this yeah. and God had this person call me and tell me to leave. And so what I'm saying is there's a difference between, uh, because I do believe the Holy Spirit speaks to us. Right? Yes. Primarily through God's <laughs> word and giving us understanding of God's word. Um, but when he's speaking to us, his speaking should always affirm God's word. Right. So I don't care how good you tell me something. If it's not affirmation of God's word, then I, I, I'm going to take it. I'm going to say, God bless you. I'm going to smile. I'm going to walk off and this is going to go right, right out the ear. Right? And I, I'm, I, yeah, I am kind of suggesting you do the same thing. Yeah. Um, I was going to say I'm not suggesting you do it, but yeah, do, do, do the same thing. Like, if it does not affirm God's word, then dismiss it. But you can dismiss it in a way without causing a ruckus. Right. Like, we, we want to cause a ruckus. Uh, I, that don't sit well in my spirit. <laughs> yeah, this, this is all the stuff. I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm telling some of the stuff that we say. I know I said, I've said it too, so not to bash, but... It's, it don't it don't it don't sit well it don't sit well in my it don't sit well in my spirit all right uh, anyways so all of us the moment we believe are filled with the Holy Spirit in John chapter 16 verse 13 through 14 it says this when the spirit of truth comes he will guide into all truth he will not speak on his own authority but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit. So the disciples are commanded to baptize in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. So if the Holy Spirit is not a person, then it would make no sense for Jesus to tell the disciples to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is what I emphasize on Wednesday night at some portion of Bible study. The Holy Spirit has a name. What is the name of the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit. That's his name. So I've been challenged right. <laughs> to, to not make the Holy Spirit so impersonal. Right. But when we address the Holy Spirit, we try, we're going to try not to address him as the Holy Spirit. Because when you say the Holy Spirit, it almost sounds impersonal, like he's not a person. Because we don't say the Jesus. The Jesus. <laughs> right? Hey, um... The Jesus, we're asking you to come here this morning. No, we just say, Jesus, we're asking you to come here. Why? Because that's his name. Yeah. Yeah. Technically. Yeah. Yeah. Not really, but you get what I'm saying. Yeah. All right, so when we go to Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is his name. So when we talk to the Holy Spirit, we want to try to talk. So I'm going to challenge you all with the same thing this week as well, that you try to make the Holy Spirit more personal when we talk, when we talk about it. 
The Holy Spirit, when it comes to his personality, he possesses uh, many personal traits uh, that the scripture emphasizes. Like in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 through 11, the Holy Spirit searches or Holy Spirit searches. Uh, Holy Spirit in 1 Timothy 4, verse 1, he makes statements. In Romans 8, 26, he helps. In Romans 8, 16, he testifies. In Acts 3, verse 5, the scripture talks about Holy Spirit being lied to and compares him being lied to, to lying to God. Or in Ephesians 4, verse 30, he's mentioned as someone who can be grieved, that we can grieve him. So these are all attributes of the person of the Holy Spirit. His ministry is where we kind of get into indwelt versus infilling. So the ministries of the Holy Spirit is not as numerous as people try to make it out to be. In fact, they can all be lumped into a few categories. But we've heard several things like this, and, and, and these are things that I say as well. So it doesn't mean that he doesn't do these things. It just means that we're going to lump them into categories for the purpose of trying to teach on the Holy Spirit. So we understand that the Holy Spirit regenerates. We've heard about the Holy Spirit quickening. We've heard about the Holy Spirit indwelling, baptizing, sealing, enlightening, convicting, comforting, drawing, assisting, interceding. Feeling, guiding, empowering, teaching. These are all things, absolutely, that the Holy Spirit does. For the purpose of this, we're going to try to condense it. So, the, in, in John 16, verses 8 through 11, this is the passage of scripture that I want you all to take because this could be another central part, passage concerning this particular teaching on pneumatology. John 16, 8 through 11, I, I mentioned it last week. When he, the Spirit, comes... He will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment in regard to sin because men did not believe in me. This is Jesus talking. All right, here we go. When the spirit comes, this is what he's going to do. He's going to convict the world of guilt. Two things we got to define. We got to define convict and we got to define what he means when he's talking about the world. In John 3.16, we knew the world to be understood as, as the cosmos, right? The created order of things. But in this particular passage, when we say world, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the unbelieving world. All right, so to convict. The word convict is translated to mean to bring light or to expose. This is the purpose of the Holy Spirit. He brings light or to expose. It is also translated to convince or to correct. So then we can define one of the roles or the main role of the Holy Spirit is to expose to information and press this information home to the inner man resulting in comprehension and response. The world, when we define the world, we define the world as simply those who have not put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what we call the unbelieving world. So then the spirit's responsibility is to bring light of righteousness of Christ to the unbelieving world so that the father might be glorified. The spirit will then show the unbelieving world that it is under God's judgment because the unbelieving world has sided with the prince of the world who is already under God's judgment. So who's the prince of the world? Satan. Satan is already under, God, under God's judgment. So you're either being influenced by Satan or you're being influenced by the spirit. So for us as believers, remember, when were we indwelt with the Holy Spirit? At salvation. So the moment of salvation, we were indwelt by the Holy Spirit, which means that there's another spirit that has taken up residence in our, in our, in our hearts. That is the Holy Spirit. He influences us. Now, Satan has influences all around us. All you got to do is cut the television on. All you got to do is cut the radio on. Um, um, I've been listening. I have, I have been hearing everybody talk about you won't break my soul. You won't break my soul. Get quiet like you don't know what I'm talking about. 
<laughs> that one. Yeah. And so I was intrigued and I was fighting myself. Don't do it, Jermaine. Don't listen to it. Don't listen to it. Like, what's the point? You already know it. Don't align with nothing that you believe. Don't listen to it. Don't listen to it. I listened to it. And I walked in the house and said, you won't break my soul. You won't break my soul. That don't got tuned to it and everything. I never listened to the lyrics. All I heard was the tune. You won't break my soul. It's just, you won't break my soul. It sound cool. Then when you start to dig deep and you listen to stuff, you realize, man, I don't know if I should be around here rocking it. And I, was, I blasted it too when I cut it on. I just wanted to. I was pulling in the outlets and I want people to think I was cool. Oh. I was blasting. <laughs> Grown man, get out the car, you won't break or something. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Thank you, Peace. I appreciate it. And you're going to rock with all the cards. But check this out. When, when we talk about the Holy Spirit and his. <laughs> when we talk about the Holy Spirit and his and his indwelling work in our lives. He indwells us the moment we believe and now we become influenced yes. by the Holy Spirit. Yes. But when we talk about the infilling of the Holy Spirit, it means that we're giving the Holy Spirit more of ourselves. But you are you are filled with them. It's like it's hard to explain. Like, you're filled with the Holy Spirit, but the scripture tells you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. All right? So you're endured with the Holy Spirit. He's all over you, wherever he's going to be. But as we yield more of ourselves, then the Holy Spirit fills us up more. Or in other words, the Holy Spirit influences us more. So you have him, you just need to be influenced more by the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean you need more of the Holy Spirit, or it doesn't mean that there's one class of Christians that got, that got this much Holy Spirit, and then the next class of Christians got this much Holy Spirit. If you're saved, you are in with the Holy Spirit. Like, Shania, how old are you? 14. Shania's 14. She's saved. She's filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm 37. Doesn't mean that because I'm 14, 24, 34, 23 years older than Shania that I have more of the Holy Spirit than her. I don't have more of the Holy Spirit than her. In fact, there are some 15, 16, 17 year olds that are influenced more by the Holy Spirit than those who've been walking with Jesus for 40 years. So baptism, indwelling, infilling, one and the same, but the more we are influenced by the Holy Spirit, the more we are being filled by the Holy Spirit. Let me say this, and I'm going to sit down. There's a passage of scripture that I wanted to read concerning um, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. It is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For we, for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we have all been given one spirit to drink. I'm going to say this concerning, uh, and I'm going to get into this at the end of the year, so please don't take it too deep right now. So this passage of scripture is often utilized when we're talking about varying roles and functions of people within within the church construct. And so we've taken this passage of scripture and we say, see, everybody's all the same in terms of what we, how we serve and how we function and what roles we play in, within the Lord's church. But this scripture is not talking about any of that stuff. The scripture is only affirming the fact that the Holy Spirit has not only indwelt us, but by that indwelling, he baptizes us. Baptism is this baptism should not be confused with water baptism, right? Obviously, water baptism is when you're dipped in the water and you come up. Spirit baptism or being baptized by the Holy Spirit just simply means that the Holy Spirit spiritually has come on the inside of us and taken up residence in you and I's life. All right, so all of us, wherever we go, the Holy Spirit goes alongside us. 
So people be like, you know, I, you know, I, I'm not, I don't go certain places because I don't, I, you know, I, I, I don't want God there. I'm, I'm just telling you, wherever you go, he, he's right. He's, listen, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, he's there. Like you can't put him in a room. Then we go do our do. Come back out, grab his hands. All right, man, you ain't seen it. No, I ain't seen it. Go with it. No, he, no, seriously, he's right there with us. It's funny, but this is the flip side of that. Well, it, it should be convicting. It, it, it should challenge us in many areas. But it also encourages us as well because he doesn't just leave us when we're doing dirty stuff. That's good news. If it's me, I'm different. Wait a minute. So you just gonna do this in front of me? Like I ain't even here right now? Deuces, you don't really belong to me anyway. No. For those of us who have the Holy Spirit, He does not leave us. Spirit does not leave. Uh, you would be at the skating ring, skating. Holy Spirit is right there. In the church, praising. Holy Spirit is right there. In the bed sleeping, Holy Spirit is right there. Or at the table eating, Holy Spirit eating. Yeah. Now, y'all not going to act like that. I didn't just drop bars right there and there. Right? Straight bars. Teach you. Don't, 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 don't think. At the club partying. Yeah, right there. On the block drinking. Wherever we are. For those of us who are possessed by the Holy Spirit, yes. he's right there. We go walking with our friends. He's at the, he's, we're on the school campus. He's right there on the school campus. And conversations that we're having on the phone, right there. In the middle of sexting, he's right there. The Holy Spirit does not read. He's always there. That's good news for us. But it should challenge and convict us as well. Like, man, I got God right here with me, never, never leaving me, never forsaking me, and I'm going to wild out as though he's not right here. You always used to wild out a little bit more when your parents weren't around, right? If your parents ain't around, you wild out a little bit more. Say things you shouldn't say, do things you shouldn't do. I overheard TJ having a conversation with his six-year-old cousin in the room one day, and I'm thinking, how do six-year-olds have these type of conversations? And I made a commitment not to go and bombard into six-year-olds' lives and conversations every little time I hear something. But I hear it, and I don't say nothing. There are times when the Holy Spirit hears it. Yeah. He don't say nothing, but it's grieving him. Yeah. It's grieving him. It's grieving him. And what it is is we think we get away with stuff, right? He's like, well, he not going to leave us. And so then you take advantage of him not leaving, and you keep doing the same silly stuff. Well, what Paul says, well, just because we got the grace of God that abounds with us, it doesn't give us the license to continue to do silly stuff that does not align with God's word, because we know that that grieves the Holy Spirit. So all of us this week have a challenge. We want to identify areas in our life that we intentionally grieve the Holy Spirit with. Not unintentionally. Right? We, we, we don't even want to focus on that yet. There are areas in our lives that we intentionally grieve the Holy Spirit with. Let's focus on that this week. Let's repent of those things and let's try to make sure we're being influenced more in, or filled more with God's Spirit. Amen? Amen. All right, that's it for the day. That's it. So, I'm going to. I'm, I'm not going to assume that everyone in the room, no music right now, I don't even need no music for it right now. I'm not going to assume that everyone in the room has the Holy Spirit. When do you get the Holy Spirit? At salvation. So I'm not going to assume that everyone in here is saved. You know whether or not you are saved. And the flip side you know whether or not the Holy Spirit has been tugging at your heart. Or maybe it's nothing that you felt prior to today, but today 
you want to respond to the message of Jesus Christ. If that is you, you slip your hand out right now, and we're going to rock with you after service. We're going to pray with you now. <laughs> Look at y'all giving already. We're going to rock with you after service, talk to you, but we're going to pray with you right now. Well, the reason we talk to you after service is because I want you to understand it's bigger than a prayer. Father, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. If you prayed that prayer with me, you're saved. It's, it's deeper than that. Yes. Matter of fact, even in scripture, we're not even told to pray a prayer to get saved. Again, stuff that we've done over and over again. We're told in scripture, if you would confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, yes. believe in your heart, Jesus Christ, by bearing the raise on the day, you're saved. Nowhere are we told you got to come and you got to pray, and when you pray, you don't get saved. The Holy Spirit is doing some regenerative work in some of our lives. It's just up to us to, to respond to that work. Now, you're going to respond one way or the other. You might not respond today, but you're going to respond one way or the other. If you're not saved, you can respond today by slipping your hand up. All right, let's pray. Father, for those of us, your children who sit in here today, believers, endure with the Holy Spirit, baptized with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, and needing to be influenced more by the Holy Spirit, which means we need to yield to ourselves and more to God. Today we come to you and we repent of those areas. Personally, I don't know theirs, it's not some type of corporate repentance, uh, but, but we're asking that those that are present in here today um, will identify those areas, repent of those areas, and then submit those portions of our lives over to you so that we can not grieve you as much as we probably do in certain areas. Father, this is beyond our ability to do alone. So we're asking that Holy Spirit would just give us the courage, the wherewithal, the strength to be able to carry this particular mission out. And we're going to give your name all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Before, are you doing the offering and closing us out, Shakina? So before Mrs. Shakina comes up, let me say this while I thought about it while I was praying. All right? And we mentioned this on Wednesday night at Bible study. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is not so much about a list of things that you are not to do. So we'll focus on, man, shoot, I was drinking this. I was well, not drinking. I, I was getting drunk. All right, I'm not going to get drunk, or I was cussing, or I'm not going to cuss, or I was being whatever, I'm not going to do that. Like, so yes, that's a part of it. But the flip side is this. There are, there are other areas in our lives where we grieve the Holy Spirit by not doing things that he's told us to do. Like, there are some areas in your life where you got to give more, not money. Like, you got to give more of yourself to people. You got to you got to invest more into service. You got to get into the church and serve. You got to get into your community and get involved. Those are areas of your life to where you could possibly be grieving the Holy Spirit because you're not doing certain things. Not because you're doing bad things. We only focus on the bad things that we're doing and we're going to try to stop doing bad stuff so that we don't grieve the Holy Spirit no more. No, there are some good things that we could be doing. So let's focus on that as well this week. Minister uh, Shakita. Amen. All right. Um, so in closing, I don't know if you guys have seen some of the things that has been on social media about a particular pastor that has humbled himself and admitted some things. But it just made me grateful for the teaching that we have the leadership that we have and the covering that we have in our pastor. And although he doesn't like any accolades, I do think something has to be said about a man of God that makes sure he does not misinterpret scripture. So he has always taught the, the principle of giving is not about guilt, it's not about fears, we've heard. 
But in this particular church, under this particular covering, it's always been emphasized giving is a heart issue. Whatever you have decided with you and the Holy Spirit is what we desire as well. So whatever you have budgeted, prayed about, and have decided to give, consistency in giving, the heart of giving is all we desire and teach. Amen? We have, I'm sure, the platforms already up to give. You can give on EasyTag, PayPal, Cash App, and Miss Tammy has envelopes in the back if you want to give in the uh, cash or check. Announcements. This is the last day to register for Vacation Bible School. If you have not already done so, the link, I believe, has already gone out this morning. Please register not just for your children, but for you, for your cousins, your nieces, your aunts, everyone. The entire family can come. Um, it is going to be a time. It is July 18th to the 22nd. Also, Bible study. Listen, this last Bible study on Zoom, baby, it was 30 people online. And for us, that is huge. <laughs> so y'all are tuning in to come get this good work. Amen. So please continue to tune in via Zoom at 7 p.m. Right now, we are only doing online until the end of, until next month. So Zoom, Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Also, if we can just please rise for benediction and you guys can have a great rest of y'all Sunday. All right, I think that was all the announcements. Yep. All right, and now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And my God give you his peace and you're going out and you're coming in and you're lying down and you're getting up. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the great word that was brought this evening and this morning. I pray that when we go home that we truly be able to decipher and read into scripture for our own understanding. In Jesus' name, amen.